Happy Sunday to you. This week we have one of the most exciting stories from the space launch industry in some time. SpaceX has successfully landed their Starship without things going sideways. Additionally, we have stories on the Crew-1 splashdown, the first Artemis mission, and a quick update on the uncontrolled re-entry of a Chinese booster. Strap in and let's prep for launch. Welcome back to Let's Get Techy. If you want to skip straight to the Starship SN15 story, I'll leave a timestamp in the description as I'm saving the best for last. First up this week is an update on the uncontrolled re-entry of a Chinese Long March 5B booster. As discussed in last week's episode, this rocket launched the first module of China's new space station, but unfortunately is going to make a re-entry... well, we aren't quite sure when or where, and that's the problem. China is notorious for allowing boosters and rocket parts to make uncontrolled re-entries to begin with. There have been multiple cases of smaller rockets falling on villages near the launch sites. This is because China launches its rockets from within mainland areas rather than near the coast like most other nations and agencies. When you launch near the coast, the leftovers, whether they be solid rocket motors or liquid propelled first stage boosters, typically crash into the sea and cause no harm. Unfortunately, this time around it's a big one. The Long March 5B booster is 30 meters long, 5 meters wide, and is currently orbiting the Earth at approximately 7 kilometers per second according to Spacenews.com. China has been criticized for not giving the booster the ability to do a controlled deorbit burn. A controlled deorbit burn would allow them to fire the engines up again so they could place the booster on a known safe trajectory for re-entry. This would be much preferred over their chosen method of crossing their fingers. The problem is this isn't a private company that a nation can force to do whatever they want. This is a country we're talking about. Realistically, there isn't much that can be done to persuade China not to do this in the future. They say it's all fun and games until someone gets hurt, and unfortunately I think it'll take someone getting hurt or a country getting very angry before China will do what needs to be done to make sure their space launch systems re-enter the atmosphere in a safe manner. Unfortunately, it's still not possible to tell where this gigantic booster is going to re-enter. I joked in our last episode that you should get subscribed so you'd be aware if a rocket might fall on your head, but in all seriousness, the likelihood of that is slimmer than you winning the lottery. It's so incredibly unlikely that a piece of debris would actually hit you that it's not something you should lose any sleep over. Having said that, you should still definitely get subscribed if you aren't already. Moving right along to a more pleasant topic, as we mentioned in a previous episode and also posted to our Instagram, make sure you're following us on Instagram by the way, link in the description. The first SLS core stage has arrived at Kennedy Space Center and the hope is that we are looking at roughly a 10 month timeline before it's ready to fly. This means that after several years of delays, we could potentially see this thing fly as soon as 2022. According to the folks over at NASA Spaceflight, the majority of the 10-month timeline is taken up by ITCO, or Integrated Testing and Checkout. This will include final stacking of the full rocket assembly, as well as attaching the Orion capsule itself. The first round of this testing will take place with an Orion simulator atop the Mammoth rocket, and then a second round will be completed after the simulator is swapped for the real deal Orion module. One thing to keep in mind is we aren't only talking about tests to make sure the rocket itself and its massive amount of subsystems are performing correctly, but there also has to be a lot of care given to the Orion module itself. The rocket and the module are both very sophisticated and complicated pieces of machinery. I think maybe when we see companies like SpaceX who innovate and use rapid prototyping to accelerate the production of a vehicle, we forget there's more than one way to build a rocket. We look forward to continue following SLS, not only because a good portion of our U.S. tax dollars have funded it, but because for a lot of people it brings with it a bit of nostalgia and remembrance of the Apollo missions. Make sure to get subscribed for future updates on SLS. Speaking of nostalgia in the Apollo era, the next story on today's flight schedule is the first nighttime splashdown of a manned U.S. space module since the Apollo era. On Sunday, May 2nd, the SpaceX Crew-1 mission that was returning from a stint at the International Space Station made a nighttime splashdown off the Gulf Coast of Florida. According to Space.com, Dragon landed on target at 2.56 a.m. EDT, making it the first nighttime splashdown in 53 years. The last time this occurred was with Apollo 8 on December 27, 1968. 
Just take a look at this brave man who's part of the recovery team scaling the side of Dragon to attach a cable to it so it can then be hoisted onto the recovery vessel. This is an amazing photo, but I can tell you right now I would not want anything to do with hanging off the side of a spacecraft at 3 in the morning in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. So hats off to this guy. And here we can see Dragon being hoisted onto the ship and into what SpaceX calls the Dragon's Nest. Upon successful landing, the team at SpaceX officially welcomed Crew-1 back to Earth and joked that if they were signed up for their frequent flyer program, they had just earned 68 million miles on this trip. Commander Mike Hopkins then responded, asking if those miles would be transferable. While we doubt they are, we think Mike deserves a trip to wherever he wants after such an incredible mission. Last up on today's flight schedule is probably the most exciting story of the week. SpaceX has finally landed a Starship prototype and kept it in one piece after the landing. After four failed attempts at fully landing and successfully recovering a Starship prototype, five was the lucky number for SpaceX. On March 5th, SN15 took to the sky shortly after 6 p.m. local time. Unfortunately, there was a cloud layer, and to make matters worse, the cameras aboard SN15 were continuously freezing and cutting out during the live stream. I suppose if you asked me beforehand would I prefer SN15 function properly or to have the cameras, I would have chosen SN15 function properly, and function properly is exactly what it did. We saw a massively upgraded Starship lift off from Boca Chica, adorned with the largest section of thermal tiles to date. As usual, prior to liftoff, vapor was pouring from its now infamous tri-vents near the bottom of the rocket. The three full-flow stage combustion cycle Raptor engines screamed to life, and before we knew it, SN15 was lost amongst the clouds. It was literally lost. Since the cameras were screwed up, we had no idea where it was. When the cameras were working properly, however, we got a fantastic view from one that had been mounted on one of the aft wings. Starship ascended to around 10 kilometers, one by one shutting down engines. Finally, the moment came and she went into skydive mode. As it approached the ground at breakneck pace, we saw something a bit different this time. Not only did it land almost perfectly, but SpaceX used two of the three Raptor engines for landing this time. This is noteworthy as initially they had planned on using just one, after a couple of failed attempts at landing, they decided they would ignite two, but quickly shut one down after confirming good thrust readings from the Raptor with the most angle to help bring it upright. It was my thoughts that this plan was due to the fact that they were unable to throttle down the Raptor engines enough so that it could still make a landing with two burning. They certainly didn't want to achieve too much thrust, as this would send Starship back to the skies rather than the ground. Since they were able to land SN-15 with two Raptors ignited, my guess is either having two on for landing was never actually an issue, or we may have just witnessed upgraded Raptors with a wider throttle range. Keep in mind, as mentioned in a previous video, SN-15 was said to have had hundreds of upgrades over its predecessors, so a wider throttle range on Raptors could very well be a possibility. Whatever the truth is behind this, it's fantastic news because generally speaking, you would always want to ignite as many engines as you can during landing so that you have some margin built in if one of the engines were to fail. SN15 and newer Starships will have the luxury of using two engines to land, and then if one were to fail during landing, there's a possibility they could still throttle up the one remaining engine to a higher thrust level and still make a safe landing. Even though this fifth test flight of Starship went almost perfectly, it wasn't without its drama. As I was watching multiple live streams of people going absolutely nuts over it having stuck the landing, I suddenly noticed there was a fire. At first, no one seemed to notice, and then the flames got to a point where everyone suddenly stopped cheering. I'm positive that at this moment everyone's mind returned to SN10. If you aren't familiar with what happened during SN10's test flight, check out my previous video on the topic. Long story short, SN10 was technically the very first high-altitude Starship prototype to make a successful, albeit very hard, landing. Upon landing, it was very obviously leaning to one side due to malfunctioning and subsequently crushed landing legs. Only minutes after having successfully landed, SN10 took to the skies again. Unfortunately, this was an unscheduled flight that ended with an unscheduled disassembly. As soon as SpaceX ground crew noticed that SN15 was on fire, they immediately started spraying it with a water cannon that was thankfully nearby the landing site. As the water cannon was battling the flames, SN15 was simultaneously detanking what little fuel it had left on board. 
it was crucial that they got as much pressure out of the tanks as quickly as possible because if the fire could not be brought under control, pressurized tanks would have added to the destruction. It was neat to see it react exactly as it should and start squirting vapors out of every orifice it had. Thankfully, after a few minutes, the fire was contained and SN-15 had made history. Word on the street is SpaceX is actually considering reflying SN-15 since it survived this test. If they do move forward with a second flight, it will definitely require some refurbishment first. For starters, it appeared even though this landing was much softer than SN-10, the landing legs did suffer some deformation upon impact, so those would definitely need to be swapped out. I would imagine the engines would at least get a once-over as well, if not completely replaced. The reason I lean towards replacing them isn't because they aren't good for another flight, but rather SpaceX could probably gather some very important data by tearing them apart and taking a look at them up close. Keep in mind this is the first set of Raptors that have completed a high altitude flight and lived to tell the story. And they absolutely are going to need to take a look at the live capture system aboard SN15 prior to a second flight because I'll have a rapid unscheduled disassembly myself if the cameras are freezing again and I can't see what's going on. And that's going to do it for this week's episode. Do you think SpaceX will refly SN15 or move on to the next prototype? What do you think about China's decision to allow their booster to flop around in the atmosphere like a ruptured COPV? Hit that like button if you know what I'm talking about and blast off in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy this type of content and click the good old bell icon to get notified when a new space news episode goes live. We've begun posting news stories and space related content on our Instagram page as well so if you're into sexy looking rocket launches or photos of mushrooms growing on Mars, we think you'll feel right at home. We appreciate you watching and we will see you in the next one.